Okay, I'll 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 hand over to you, and I'll just switch my my own video off and um uh, and let you get started. There we are. Seeing that as the start. That's it. Yeah, that looks that's that's perfect. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming along tonight. I'm Nick Broden. I work for the Berwickshire Northumberland Marine Nature Partnership. Uh, the Marine Nature Partnership is a partnership of getting on for 30 different organisations uh, who have uh, joined together, who have a particular interest in the management of our inshore marine environment, and in particular with the suite of inshore marine protected areas that we have there. And our members include uh, sort of statutory agencies, NGOs, things like Port and Harbour authorities as well, and, and local authorities. Um, so again, uh, I'm going to... Yeah, sorry, I will just move the, the window there. Uh, so in terms of what I'm going to discuss tonight, uh, I'm going to start by giving a sort of quite a high level overview of the marine protected areas that we've got in Berkshire and Northumberland um, and about what makes our course special. I'm going to touch briefly on the importance of uh, data management in marine protected areas and the role that um, um, sort of voluntary recorders can play in contributing data towards that. And then I'm going to end by talking about uh, a project we've got running called Ida Ware, which is linked to one of the, the newer marine protected areas that we have in Northumberland. And I should say, um, if anyone recognises St Mary's, although our name is Berwickshire Northumberland Marine Nature Partnership, we do actually cover the area from the Tyne. So we do cover North Tyne side as well. That area is sort of from fast, uh, from... Uh, from the, the time to Fast Castle Head in Scotland. Um, so I just wanted to start just by a bit of clarification about the term marine protected area. Just say this because uh, the term uh, marine protected area or MPA is used in a slightly different context depending on where you are in the world and, and what type of site you're talking about. But uh, in terms of this talk, when I talk about a marine protected area, I'm basically talking about a designated site which is covered permanently uh, or, or intermittently by seawater. So that's going to include both the subtidal areas that are permanently covered by the sea, but also the intertidal areas um, as well. Um, and uh, although I'm using marine protected area as a sort of umbrella term, sort of underlying that is a whole sort of alphabet soup of different uh, designation names done under different legislation. But just to say, I'm not going to talk about the various different sort of underpinning designations in any sort of detail but if anyone's desperate to know about what the difference between the SPA and SAC etc is at the end I'm happy to answer questions at the end. Okay. Um, so in terms of uh, marine protected areas then in uh, Berkshire and Northumberland or between the time and Fast Castle Head uh, we have 11 in the, the inshore, inshore waters there. These have been designated over a period of so over 21 years at different points uh, under different legislation and covering different interest features as well. So they, they range widely from sites such as the Berkshire North Northumberland Coast SAC, which is a, a huge site that stretches from Allen Mouth up into up into the Scottish borders and St Abs, and covers over 65,000 hectares in area, down to smaller sites such as the Allen SG uh, Marine Conservation Zone, which is less than 40 hectares and actually the smallest uh, marine protected area uh, in the UK. Um, the, the yellow splodge, uh, or the, sorry, the orange splodge on the left there, which I always think looks a bit like a, an elephant turned on its side, is an overlapping map of actually all of those uh, marine protected area boundaries. And you can see from that what a sort of highly protected uh, marine environment we do have in Northumberland and the borders as well. And I think th this, this sometimes uh, surprises people because I don't think they realise just how valuable our, our marine environment is and don't realise that actually we have um, some of the most, uh, you know, important marine sites in, in Europe just on our, on our doorstep. Um, as I say, the, 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 the marine protected areas are designated for different things. Um, if you put together the, the, the full list of all the reasons for designation of those uh, 11 sites, um, it does run into sort of over two dozen um, 
um, different interest features. But what I want to do is just give you a sort of quick overview of some of the, the main points of that and give you a flavour of actually why, why this area, of course, is so important and what, what, its, what its interests are uh, by looking at a few, few, few key things. So, uh, sorry, the slides seem to be changing uh, quite rapidly here. Um, so the first thing I wanted to mention was, was Rocky Reef. Um, so I think probably most people will have visited uh, areas of rocky shore, such as we find at you know, St. Mary's Lighthouse or places like Boomer, and have experienced that and maybe gone rock pooling there as well. But I think what people don't realise is actually that there's these sort of rocky habitats are actually some of the most, most diverse habitats that we've got in the whole of the North Sea, um, for the reason uh, that they're subject to a wide range of different sort of topographies and landforms, sort of tidal regimes and uh, levels of exposure, which create a lot of different niches for marine plants and animals to, um, to colonise. Um, so, um, this slide just shows a few examples of some things you might find. So, um, for example, if you're in the, the, the sort of intertidal rocky, rocky shore, you might come across things like uh, the starfish, such as the bloody henry starfish in the middle there. Or if you're lucky and you're, it's particularly low tide and down at low tide, you might see something like the Blue Ridge Limpet, uh, which is down in the bottom left hand corner there, which is actually one of my favourite marine animals, just a tiny little mollusk but with lovely electric blue raising it. Um, I say, I think although most people are in, uh, sort of familiar with sort of rocky shore in the intertidal, I think what they don't realise in terms of Northumberland and Berwickshire is actually that, that, that reef feature, that rocky reef feature actually extends quite a significant way into the subtidal area as well. So in subtidal areas, it supports things like uh, 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 sort of uh, rack, such as you can see in the bottom there. And as you get lower and the light levels get to day, you start getting colonised by things like sponges and anemones. And a beautiful picture of a, a sun star there as well, provided by Paula Radcliffe, uh, Paula Lightfoot, sorry. And then moving from the sort of hard habitats to the soft ones, I want to mention sort of sort of intertidal sediment uh, habitats, such as mud flats, uh, sand flats, and salt marsh. I'm really keen to mention these because I think in many ways they're sort of Cinderella habitats, and I think they have a they're slightly overlooked by the general public, and especially I think the, the public view of something like intertidal mud. They probably regarded as being quite boring and possibly just a bit smelly. Well, actually, from a from an ecological point of view, these habitats are really um, exciting and interesting, and very productive habitats as well that play an important role in wider functioning of ecosystems. So, so for example, intertidal mud contain can contain some very high density of invertebrates such as you know marine worms uh, that can in turn be used as an important food source uh, for for feeding birds as well. Um, so in terms of the photographs I've got here as well, on the top uh, left hand side, I've got a picture of the Allen Estuary then, some mud flat there. On the top right hand side, I think you probably uh, can guess where that is from the, the shelter, but that's sort of Lindisfarne, which is probably one of the biggest extents of, 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 of mud flat and salt mar and, and uh, sand flat that we have on the, on the Northumberland coast. And then the bottom middle, uh, that's the Tweed Estuary, which again is, a, is an internationally important sort of estuary in terms of its wildlife. And a big part of that is actually the intertidal habitats that you find there. Um, these habitats are also of interest because they get colonized by other things as well. So in the bottom left-hand corner there, you'll see a blue mussel bed. Uh, and again, you often get these colonising on areas of, of, of mud or sand, particularly in areas like uh, the Blythe Estuary or around Lindisfarne again. And this is the useful because the, the, they in turn provide food for other, other animals, but they also provide sort of secondary habitat that can be colonised by other things as well. So you'll see the, the mussels there being sort of colonised by barnacles. Um, and then the bottom right hand side and I apologize this is a very poor picture of seagrass uh, which um, some people do think is a type of, of seaweed incorrectly but it is actually a vascular plant that does actually grow in the marine area so seagrass um, 
the, the seagrass beds that have colonized the mudflats um, and sand flats around Lindisfarne are actually the biggest ones that we have uh, in the east coast of England. So the, the scientific name for seagrass is, is Zostra. And I think until a few years ago, it was probably quite a, it didn't have much of a profile as a habitat, but actually I think partly thanks to the, the good work of people like Operation Seagrass, I think it's, it's, it's raised in the public consciousness now. And I think people are much more aware of the importance of, of Zostra beds particular for things like capturing and locking up of atmospheric carbon, but also for the wider sort of ecosystem benefits it brings, like acting as a, a nursery area for, for fish. Um, and then finally, in this sort of quick overview of habitats, I wanted to mention sort of subtitle sediments. Um, so it, it, if if you ever look at the, the 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 long list of all the all the the designated features for the marine protected areas um, in in Northumberland, you'll come across a number of them which are sort of sediment types and tend to have rather sort of dull um, technocratic name like uh, marine mixed sediments or marine sands, um, which doesn't don't actually mean a lot to a lot of people. But actually, they're, they're important to these habitats, although they have very boring names. Uh, is is that is is an, is an actually the the species that they support and the range of wildlife that these these habitats support. So this is an example of just five um, almost random photographs again uh, taken from marine sediments uh, from the area between um, St Mary's Lighthouse up into the Scottish borders. Again, provide it from by Paula Lightfoot of GNCC. And again, shows the, the range of things we've got. Um, and I think personally, I think one of the slight frustrations with um, working in marine conservation is that although we have sort of nationally and internationally important marine sites just on people's doorsteps, I think uh, they're, they're largely inaccessible to people, uh, or literally inaccessible unless people are actually divers or snorkelers. So people can't engage with them the same way they might be able to do with a sort of woodland or meadow. So I think photographs like this are really helpful in actually showing us the range of wildlife that we have literally a short distance from where people live. So going from sort of bottom right uh, round, so we've got a, an octopus there, for example, that was photographed taken actually very close to St Mary's Lighthouse in North Tyneside. We've got a squat lobster top right, lovely sort of blue red colours on it. The middle picture is about lemon sole, uh, which I'm sure some of you have had on your, your plate at some point, but probably haven't. Uh, sorry, seems to be a bit trigger happy, the, um, uh, the slide mechanism today, uh, but you've possibly never seen one in the wild. We've got a sea slug at the top and then some sea stars at the bottom. Um, Sorry, bear with me. Um, so yeah, so that was a that was a very sort of quick overview of some of the main sort of habitat highlights that we have, and some of the, some of the reasons, the sort of habitat reasons, as it were, why we have these uh, protected areas. I just want to talk quickly about some of the um, the species interests as well of these. So just first off, just want to briefly mention uh, grey seal, which is a reason for notification for at least one of the MPAs that we have in uh, Northumberland and the borders. So I think you're all probably familiar on the call with grey seal, um, which is breeds in, in numbers uh, now amounting to their, their thousands in places like the Farne Islands and uh, around St Abs and Eymouth as well. So very significant uh, UK populations. Uh, on the east coast there and indeed uh, in a UK context the UK has something like a third of the world population of grey seals so uh, we're very um, uh, we, we do have a particular responsibilities I think for um, uh, for the, the the conservation of that species. I'm sorry the slides seem to be removing without me even touching the uh, the pointer now so I think uh, it's a bit uh, anyway, I'll try not to lean on the desk, that'll probably help. Um, and then last but not least, I actually wanted to mention birds. Um, if you think back to that uh, early slide I showed you that listed all of the marine protected areas uh, between the Tyne and Fastcastle Head, actually about two thirds of those are actually designated uh, for their bird interest. 
and I think some people occasionally ask me or, or sort of occasionally struggle with the concept of marine protected areas being designated for birds as their interest feature, but I think it, it makes sense if you realise actually the, the reason uh, that those bird species are there is because of the, the sort of the marine environment and they require that healthy marine environment to provide sort of food resources both for themselves, their, their chicks, and also to provide areas of things like sort of uh, loafing and molting as well. So we have a very wide range of different individual bird species. Uh, uh, that, that form um, reasons for designation and selection of the marine protected areas that we've got. Um, so that ranges from uh, breeding bird interests, uh, from sort of colonial seabirds to sort of individual species as well, but also wintering uh, interest as well. So things like wintering waders and wildfowl. Um, in terms of the interest features, they cover both uh, individual species that might be important and it might be present in national or internationally important numbers, but also they cover some of the important assemblages of those birds as well. So, for example, the whole the whole sort of assemblage of colonial breeding, cliff breeding seabirds in places like the Farne Islands or St Ab's Head, or a notification feature in their own right and are considered important, as well as some of the individual species within that. Um, so on this slide, I've just demonstrated, I've just picked sort of three bird species um, just to, to demonstrate some of this, two of which are sort of breeding bird species here and one of which is wintering. Um, so, and all of them, you'll notice in common that the, 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 the sort of common denominator between all these is, is food and, and feeding, which again, to make that link to the importance of a healthy marine environment and a productive marine environment to support these bird species. So uh, on the, the left hand side there, you've got everyone's favourite bird or second favourite bird after the Ida anyway, uh, the puffin with a, a beak full of sand eels. Uh, sand eel is a, is a very common fish that's found in sort of sandy sediments uh, along the coast and is also actually really very important food source for a wide range of seabirds as well and you may have actually heard um, in the news about some declines in other parts of the country like Shetland which has been partly attributed to um, reductions in numbers or qualities of um, sand, eel, num of <coughs> sand eels. Um, then on the far right there we've got uh, Sorry, it moved without prompting again. Then on the far right there, we've got common tern, which is one of the five species of breeding tern uh, that we have on the Northumberland coast. And there you can see uh, bringing back uh, a clupid of some kind. So that's either a young herring or spot, I'm not sure, right, uh, which has been fishing for uh, in, in, in the seas around its breeding ground. And then finally in the middle there, that, that bird there, which you see there is, is, is a purple sandpiper. Uh, a lovely photograph there provided by my colleagues in the Space for Shorebirds project. So purple sandpiper is a wintering bird uh, along the northeast coast. Um, it actually breeds in the Arctic, but um, uh, sort of winters here on our coast between sort of October to, to end of March. Um, it's something of a rocky shore specialist as well, so it tends to be found on those rocky areas, uh, feeding on, on sort of beds of seaweed here as well for invertebrates to feed it to get it over the winter. But again, this is one of a number of, uh, of, 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 of waders and indeed wildfowl that, that make use of our intertidal areas um, during the winter months. So that was a say that was a, a whistle whistle stop tour of actually some of the uh, some of the reasons why our suite of uh, marine protected areas are designated, and I'm hoping a lot was a very partial view. I hope it give you a sort of overview of the the range of interest features we've got and why some of them are important. About that, um, I just wanted now just to quickly touch on. Um, the importance of data in terms of marine conservation itself. So um, I think it's fair to say, I don't think you can under, underestimate the importance of actually good quality data to inform conservation uh, activity in the mean. 
environment in the marine environment. So we need good data in order to be able to, you know, assess the conditions of the designated sites, say they're actually meeting all of their objectives are in good health. We need good quality data to monitor populations of the individual species within those sites. We need good quality data to be able to monitor changes in those sites. So, you know, whether some species are declining or being replaced by others, whether we're getting sort of new native species moving into an area, whether we're getting potentially non-native species in the area, such as the uh, uh, orange lip sea squirt, uh, which is at the bottom there, that, that picture there as well. So again, um, and we need data also to be able to uh, monitor our impacts, uh, you know, whether the, the conservation uh, management interventions we're making, whether they're actually being successful or not, whether they're, they're helping to uh, lead to a more robust and diverse marine environment. And we also need that sort of data also to, to assess properly um, human impacts uh, on the marine environment and whether anything is having an issue, and if so, where. So a, a wide range of organisations are involved in collecting that sort of information. And a lot of that does actually come from voluntary recorders through uh, recording activities, including some big recording schemes as well. So I think um, Fiona said at the beginning of the talk about all records, uh, uh, that all records matter. And I, I think that's a, a message that, that can't be stressed enough. I mean, any any biological records that you wish to submit are of use to someone somewhere, whether, whether they're of rare things or whether they're of common things, and whether they're of um, collected in a sort of casual basis, for example. So, so things submitted through the uh, ERIC uh, recording portal or through one of the many wildlife recording apps that are available now as well, or whether they're collected in a sort of more rigorous and ongoing way. So, just mentioned there under that uh, the the uh, webs the wetland bird survey that's been run uh, by BTO for a number of years now again using volunteers and is really a, a sort of cornerstone of UK conservation that that data set that they've collected and really really invaluable in terms of being able to to monitor changes in populations of of coastal birds over a long period of time. Uh, and also valuable data that's that's regularly used to uh, inform about the evidence base, for example, new designations to of sites as well. Um, another sort of a sort of national, um, some more systematic scheme you might be aware of if you're a dive or snorkeler is Sea Search, which is led on by the Marine Conservation Society and sort of trains people and encourages people to um, collect. Uh, data about the the marine wildlife that they find when they're out diving or snorkeling and again this is a really important uh, data set because as you appreciate there's um, perhaps less footfall for the casual reporter in the in the subtitle areas than you might find in a, a forest um, or meadow so actually having that sort of scheme provides really useful information um, and then finally the 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 last thing I've flagged up there is is a number of, of organisations and deep projects uh, have a have a strong citizen science edge to them now as well. So the example I put there is the Berwickshire Marine Reserve, which operates around St Abs, and has been doing some really great work on monitoring and, and, data, and data collection um, uh, around the voluntary marine reserve there, and or an organisation that again is using volunteers to do that. Um, and is often asking for volunteers. So if you live near the borders or in the borders or prepared to travel in the borders, interested, do look out for like their website and their social media and their call outs of volunteers because they're doing a lot of great stuff there as well. And sorry, it feels like it's on time. Yeah. Um, changing automatically. Um, yeah, but again, and uh, again, that that li this this list is just a, a subset, a, a few examples, lots of other mechanisms for recording lots of other schemes lots of other projects were involved in citizen science where we're data collection as well and as i say all all data matters and and all data no matter what route it comes in through is going to be valuable in actually building up that picture of what's happening in the marine environment and um, so 
uh, in the, the sort of second half of the talk, I just wanted to talk um, in a bit more detail about one particular project we've got running at the moment called Ida Ware Northeast, um, which is something we've done some work with Eric Northeast uh, with over as well, and which is particularly linked to one of the newer marine protected areas uh, that we've got on the, the Northumberland coast. Um, so I say it's particularly linked to the Berwick to St Mary's Marine Conservation Zone that was designated in 2019. Uh, the left there, I'm afraid I slightly apologise for the quality of the, the map, I say this was the best I could get, but that purple outline shows the extent of the site. Uh, and you can see it's actually quite a, a, a big extensive site and as the name suggests, uh, extends from basically Tweedmouth more or less down to just south of St Mary's Island. Um, among the sort of suite of marine protected areas we've got in Berkshire and Northumberland, it's perhaps unusual in that it's designated for single interest feature. So all the other sites are designated for multiple habitat or, or, or species interest. But um, about St Mary's is designated solely in recognition of the nationally important uh, numbers of uh, breeding and wintering Ida that we have uh, along the Northumberland coast. And I'm sure probably most of you have, have seen an Ida, but if not, I've got a, a quick clip um, that I recorded at Sea Houses Harbour actually a couple of weeks ago. This is a, a male Ida there, and you can see very distinctive bird, uh, black and white coloration, lovely green make to it. Um, and around this time of year, if you're around, they're starting to do their, um, uh, they're, they're, they're starting to do uh, their, 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 their sort of breeding calls with the females. So it's not unusual to see them out in the course of throwing their heads back in a, in a display like that and making sort of cooing noises, which I think the traditional way to describe them is they sound a bit like Frankie Howard. Um, I was trying to get a sound clip to actually embed in this presentation, but unfortunately the technology failed me. So I afraid you'll have to, if you've not heard a, a sort of Ida, male Ida call before, I think you'd have to dig one out or online after the presentation. Um, and it's sort of well worth it. Um, so yes, this, um, this, this, this second slide shows a male ida, but you can see the female ida in, in the bottom there. The female ida is, uh, fair to say, not as showy as the male, but it's still a very attractive plumage if you get to look at it close, a very nice sort of chestnut brown tortoise shell um, uh, affair. She's got a more sort of cryptic coloration, actually provide camouflage when she's on the nest as well. But again, like the male, she has that very distinctive uh, sloping, forehead and wedge shaped head as well. Um, so the Ida is um, the UK's largest duck. Um, it's also, despite its, its, its size and its weight, it's also it, the, apparently the uh, UK's fastest duck as well and has been re recorded of flying up to speeds of up to 50 miles an hour. Um, importantly in terms of sort of marine protected areas in this presentation. I just also, they're also a tree, true sea duck. Uh, so they're found only at the coast and they're adapted to the harsh conditions uh, found there. Uh, they feed on shellfish, uh, usually mussels, but they will eat things like crabs as well, uh, they, which they sort of swallow whole and then crush in their gullets. And they're very well adapted to, with strong leg mussels to actually swimming and finding that food from the seabed as well. Um, I see it, their main food is, is shellfish. Uh, and unfortunately, it, it's, it seems to be becoming increasingly common in areas where idas and people uh, interact with each other, that um, sort of well-meaning people are starting to feed uh, idas, things like bread and chips, uh, presumably just on thinking that, you know, feeding wildlife is a good thing. But actually, I'm sure as you can appreciate for an animal that's adapted to eating, eating seafood and, and shellfish, actually human food doesn't really contain a lot of nutritional value for them. So although they will eat it, um, it isn't necessarily to their benefit. And there is sort of um, evidence that, that poor diet from eating things like bread and chips can affect, um, for example, the, the strength of the eggs um, that females lay because of lack of calcium in the diet. And there is evidence also that young idas, if they're eating the wrong food, can develop, uh, have sort of uh, 
uh, troubles with the development of wings as well, which may affect their ability to fly in later life as well. So please, if you see an eye there, even if it's tempting and even if they look like they're wanting a feed, please don't do so. Um, so eiders are found along all of the north, win, wintering eiders are found along all of the Northumberland coast, indeed up into the Berwickshire as well. But the main sort of breeding areas uh, for the species are on the Farne Islands and on Corked Island, although there are some sort of uh, sort of inland or, or inshore um, attempts at breeding as well in a few locations. But those two islands are the main areas. Um, Nest building and chick rearing is left entirely to the females. So at this stage, um, unfortunately, the, the, the males have, have long disappeared and found something else at the time. So they leave it all to the female to do. Uh, they're, they're ground nesters. So the female will make uh, a nest in a, a hole in the ground, often within vegetation or surrounded by vegetation. Uh, she lines the nest with eider down plucked from her own breast uh, and lays her eggs. Uh, so the, 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 the period between sort of uh, egg hatch and egg lay is about a month uh, on average. And during that period of time, actually, the female doesn't feed herself at all. So within that, that month long period, she, they can lose, the female eiders can lose up to like a third of their body weight, uh, which makes it very important that they're in a good sort of nutritional status, that they're well fed before the breeding season. And again, there is evidence that that uh, eiders who are, have not met the right sort of condition in terms of their food intake will put off breeding in certain years. And even where they do breed, there may be sort of reduced uh, egg numbers, uh, reduced chick size, uh, that sort of thing. So again, that's another good reason to avoid sort of feeding eiders food that maybe they shouldn't be uh, eating, uh, i.e. bread and chips. So once uh, eiders hatch, they, 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 they don't hang around in the nest for long. They take to the water within 48 hours of hatching and often sometimes earlier than that as well. So uh, birds on the thorns and on Corked Island on the islands will then sort of make the journey across from the islands actually to sheltered locations on the mainland where they can then have the, the chicks feeding. So uh, things like harbours and salt marshes are particularly well used for that. And again, Amble Harbour as pretty well-known place or has been to observe uh, those, those chicks once they start coming off Corked Island. Uh, the groups of chicks are sort of supervised by groups of mothers and by non-breeding females called aunties who get them together to sort of share the, share the watching. And again, this is a good mechanism to sort of protect the, protect the chicks from predators as well, especially during that crossing uh, from from the islands uh, to the, the more sort of sheltered in, inland waters as well. Um, and then a lot of I've talked here about the, the, the sort of the conservation importance of IDAs uh, and their, their sort of ecology. I think if we're talking about Northumberland and the, the Northeast more generally, I think we need to also mention actually the cultural importance of eiders and the, the, the role they play for people even who may not uh, necessarily have an automatic interest in birds or even, even wildlife as well. And I think especially in Northumberland, uh, uh, they have a sort of special place in people's hearts. Uh, partly because of the, um, the strong association with the, the mythology around St Cuthbert. So St Cuthbert was reputed to have given protection to Ida ducks on the Farne Islands in the 7th century. Um, there's probably a bit of uh, hype in terms of that, that's not quite true, but all the same, that legend has been in place and well promoted for over a millennium now, and it's, it's, it's found its place very much into the iconography around St Cuthbert. Um, who, for those of you who don't know, was the, the seventh century Bishop of Lindisfarne is now buried in Durham Cathedral. Uh, so apart from that, for, for this reason, I think uh, Ida's, um, they found their ways into a lot of logos and signage for various parts of things to do with Northumberland, and they're also the county bird of Northumberland. So uh, the two photographs at the top there are, are sort of Paul Morrison, who's the RSBB warden for Corked Island, who uh, um, I'm a, I'm, fairly new to matters to have Ida Duck, but Paul has been working on with Ida's for years and is a real local expert uh, on them as, as, as well. Um, 
And again, he's holding two flags there. So one uh, on the, the right there is the flag of what was the old sort of Northumberland Coast uh, conservation volunteers who were a conservation group who were active in the in, in the 90s and the early 2000s as well. And again, just to demonstrate that they, they were one of the many organisations that actually had Ida Duck in their logo for that. And then the other flag there, the cross is actually the cross of St Cuthbert. So again, that's again showing that link with St Cuthbert. And again, that that flag is is flown every year on March the twentieth, uh, which is feast day of St Cuthbert, actually on Corpid Island on the the flagpole there. So I've talked about Ida's in the sort of Northumberland context, but this map just gives you a bit more information about the, the sort of global context for them and actually shows their distribution as uh, so it's the map I, I pulled off Wikipedia. So the green area, so the breeding range, which you'll notice is sort of most of the northern latitudes and the northern areas. And then the, the light blue is the, the wintering and feeding range. And you can see there um, that the, um, the, the, the green around the British Isles comes down to, to Northumberland. And it should be noted that actually Corkhead Island is the southernmost um, uh, breeding location for Idas in the UK. Um, so Idas, although they have a wide distribution, they are actually declining across the whole of their range, including Northumberland. Um, there is thought to be a number of reasons for this. So there's not one sort of, um, one one definite main reason everywhere it's sort of slightly different things in different places but uh the 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 pressures that ida's face includes the predation of chicks and eggs so that's particularly predation of young chicks uh, by things like large gulls but also um mammals can take eggs as well on, on nests uh, if, if they get access to some of the breeding areas We've already mentioned food supply and food quality, which can be issues affecting breeding success. Disturbance, um, like all coastal birds, um, disturbance does take a, does pose a, a, a sort of burden on, on them in that it can uh, displace birds from feeding areas during times when they actually need to be feeding to, uh, to, to get up their body mass or provide the energy they need on cold days. And it can also lead to um, sort of unnecessary energy expenditure as well if they're having to move out of the way of disturbance uh, while they're avoiding it. And then finally, adverse weather, which you can imagine for a coastal bird in northern latitudes, uh, that can cause issues with both um, uh, for both sort of chicks and for adult birds as well, and for 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 eggs. Um, so. In, in, in recognition of the sort of importance um, of Northumberland to Ida, both in the sort of conservation sense, but also in that sort of wider cultural sense as well, um, and prompted by the designation, I say, of the Berwick to, to St Mary's uh, MZZ, um, a couple of years ago, um, actually uh, in early 2000 just literally before the first uh, COVID lockdown started um, uh, the Marine Nature Partnership started a, a project called Ida Aware Northeast which aimed to sort of celebrate our Idas and a ways awareness about the importance of Northumberland for them and about some of the threats that they were facing so we were lucky enough to get funding for that project through Northumberland Water branched out and through Northumberland Coast Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty um, so that project has had a, a number of outputs from it, including events, which again, slightly um, uh, or more than slightly uh, affected by COVID. But we have managed to do a number of online events through that, including holding a, what we call an Ida Duck Day online on the 20th of March this year, where we had a number of sort of online presentations of our materials as well, just to celebrate Ida on the feast day of St Cuthbert. Um, and all of the material from that day is actually still available on our YouTube channel to view. So, for example, it includes a, a presentation on IDAS from Paul Morrison from the RSPV, as well as talks about St Cuthbert and uh, other sort of uh, issues affecting IDAS as well. Um, we've commissioned a short project, a short film as part of the project from uh, local wildlife uh, filmmaker Cain Scrumminger, which should be available soon and will be promoted through all our normal social media channels. And then finally, 
Um, and what I'm going to spend the rest of the presentation talking about is we have a sort of public participation element, a survey element of that as well, uh, aimed at collecting data on, on IDAS, which is an area that we've been working with Eric Northeast on. So in terms of, of IDA recording, um, I, all IDA re records are valuable to us and help us to target uh, conservation activity. Um, so as, as part of the project, we worked with um, Eric Northeast and commissioned the production of a recording uh, app from them as well that allowed us to, to capture information about uh, uh, locations and numbers of providers along the coast, but also importantly, um, um, allowed us had a function that allowed us to record instance of either disturbance uh, through that. So it, through that, we were able to record if you've seen Ida's being disturbed by uh, human activity and what the sort of result of that disturbance was as well, which is a valuable part of the um, uh, information resource. So the app is available uh, to, to download on your phone or tablet as, a, as an app that works within Survey123, uh, which is a, a separate recording app, which I think possibly some of you on the, the Zoom call may already have access to. Uh, or it can be open just uh, on a normal computer laptop uh, as, a, as a sort of browser version as well. Um, I'm going to say a bit more about just how to, in the next few slides, about how to access the browser version. I'm not going to touch so much on how you actually download the, the app version as well. Uh, but there are there is a step by step guide to that uh, on our YouTube channel, which I'll provide a link for as well, which shows you how to do it. But I will sort of show you how to access the, the browser version. Um, so this map uh, on the side there is the, the records we saw for uh, obtained through the app. So uh, up to now, we, we've got 379 records uh, through that, which is really valuable. And uh, thank you to anyone on the call who has submitted those records. So that, that, that's, that's really helpful that um, together with sort of information from other sources um, and other recording schemes really helps build up that overall picture about how IDAs are using the Northumberland Post. And in addition, it also you know helps build up that that evidence base about disturbance and whether disturbance is an issue, and if so, in what areas it's an issue. Um, so as you can see, we've got quite a, a decent spread um, of records uh, throughout that area. Um, there are still a few gaps there where it would be nice to have some more records. So particularly around Drew Ridge Bay, and then interestingly. Um, up around Lindisfarne as well, uh, we're still fairly short of records, but I suspect that might be that many of the people who are sort of recording regularly around Lindisfarne are providing records to about sort of national schemes rather than using the app in that way. And also just wanted to take the opportunity to make, do a big shout out to um, the, um, the, um, uh, the, 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 the Wildlife Conservation Society at St Mary's Island which is this big blob in the, the, the bottom there. There have been real stars in terms of putting lots of records uh, onto the app and making regular use of that as well. Um, so I say our recording app is available to download through our, our, our website. And I've done a, a, short, a short sort of little screen uh, capture here that actually shows you how to do this. Um, again, you probably only have to do this once and then also you can, um, uh, you, you can uh, you can then uh, bookmark it, but essentially, if you need to find uh, the app, access the app to record a method, go to our website, which is www.exportoccurrence. and then if you head from there to the projects section. Uh, click on the Ida Ware Northeast link. And then, okay, this seems to have uh, frozen. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, and then from there, go down to record your Ida sightings. Click on that, and then that. Uh, 
will give you where you can actually submit the app as well uh, or download the app. And again, um, I've given you the sort of long version there. I will give you a, a shortcut link to that page as well later on, but just if you need to follow it through there. And of course, then you can sort of book, bookmark uh, that as well. And again, clicking on that link will take you to this page where you can download both the uh, the app version, again, which I won't cover, but there is an online guide to if you need to do it or the browser version. And this this example shows you how to open the browser version. So you click on that um, and then that will take you to the recording app. And again, it's a very simple recording sheet there where you will be asked uh, just some, some basic information about how many ideas you saw, when you saw them, um, uh, when you saw them, where you saw them, and about whether there was any disturbance you witnessed to the ideas, and if, if the answer to that is yes, then there's a few more questions about what was the cause of the disturbance and uh, um, and uh, what the impact was. Okay, uh, so just 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 some links for you. Um, if you want more information about the IDA Web project, including some background information, more background information about IDAs and some more links to videos and things like that, uh, this is the uh, the full web address. So again, you can link to that through the projects page of our homepage of our website. If you want to go straight to the Record Your IDA Sightings page, this is the link. And then finally, I say we have a number of help guides and a number of IDA related videos. Um, on our YouTube channel. So that's a, a shortened link to that. And then uh, and then that that's that's it from me really. So thank you for your attention. Um, here are my contact details. Um, both email and again where re the partnership is reachable through all of the normal social media channels and on YouTube. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions now. If you have any questions after the talk that you want to contact me or email, I'm happy to try and answer them. Um, again, um, thank you. Uh, any Anyone who has contributed records to the recording app, uh, they are very valuable. Uh, we do appreciate them. One thing I should have mentioned as well, uh, as I noticed um, Steve Percival is on the call, is that the, the records that we are collecting all going into a larger project that our local Natural England office is running, looking at uh, evidence around Ida Duck. So they're doing a lot of data collation, looking at Ida Duck distribution and looking at evidence about sort of anthropogenic um, impacts on them as well. So all of the records that we're collecting is feeding into that project and then we'll feed into wider conservation activity and particularly of, of conservation advice for that MPA as, as, as well. Um, and then the other thing I would say is please keep an eye open for Ida Duck Day coming up on the 20th of March. Details should be online soon as well. And please do check out our YouTube channel for uh, videos from our previous Ida Duck Day. And I'll stop sharing now. Uh, yeah, apologies, that, that, that uh, presentation it seemed to be changing of its own accord. I don't know if it was just on a, a set time for every slide for some reason, so. It, it, was, it wasn't too um, uh, sort of intrusive. Um, it was fine, yeah, we could still follow along okay. So um, um, thanks for that, Nick. Uh, it's, um, it's great, I think, to just pause and, uh, you know, I'm just thinking about view again of the, the Northumberland coast and we're so, we can take it for granted so easily. Um, we're really, really lucky to have such a, uh, amazingly diverse uh, and rich, rich coastal habitats here. It's, it's, it was nice to be just reminded of them and have a little re refocus on that. Um, I think we've got a, a couple of questions in in the chat there, um, Paula. I can probably just read them out if uh, yeah, certainly if um if yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. So Dee's asking. When did the app launch and did it collect all 379 recorded sightings or were they submitted using a, a range of methods? Oh, sorry, the app launched, uh, <laughs> I say basically, I think it launched in, the, went live in March 2020. So with terrible timing, <laughs> just as no one could leave the house. <laughs> and it was obviously, um, would not have been, um, 
advisable to be trying to encourage people to do things like wildlife recording when all the strong messaging was stay local, stay at home. So that that although the app existed, we didn't really sort of promote it for quite a long time, just from that point of view of not wanting to be seen to be sort of trying to encourage people to travel unnecessary distances while there was still a lot of restrictions around. So so it's 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 we probably um it's probably been pushed a bit harder in the last sort of uh, a year or so, but no, all all of those all of those three hundred seventy nine records all been entered directly onto the app. They're not from from other sources. I suppose that that's just prompted a, a question in my head. Is there a time limit on the project and recording, or will it sort of run on and on? Yeah, it's 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 open ended. I mean, our our our, our funding from uh, the main sort of partners from Nothing Been Water and the NOB has come to an end now because we sort of delivered what we said we would there in their funding agreement. But certainly Ida where will be going on sort of indefinitely. And we do see there's a mechanism for raising awareness about that particular MPA and about the importance of Ida. And I think as you probably picked up from the presentation, I think Ida is a good species to use because it's it's one that has that sort of uh, those cultural links as well. So even if people are not necessarily that interested in birds or coastal wildlife, I think Ida is important to a number of people for wide for wider sort of local, local reasons and cultural reasons as well. So actually, I think it's a very good mechanism for getting conservation messages across, especially around the northeast coast as well. Uh, so yeah, the project is ongoing, and obviously we've got things like Ida Duck Day coming up in March next year. And certainly the, the app won't be going anywhere. We'll, it'll still be live and records will still be fed, fed into it and will then go to Eric as well. So they will be used for conservation. Yeah, great, great. And um, Dee, Dee was just asking as well, uh, with the survey and re re region, um, how far south can people submit records from? <laughs> I think um, uh, that's that's probably a question for Paul have set up that. I think it, it, it's a law, the project is based in Northumberland. You can, I think you can probably put them from anywhere in the UK. And I'm guessing certainly if they're from south of the Tyne, but still in the northeast, then Eric will still make use of them. I'm guessing if you get records from outside of the Eric area, you'll just pass those on to the relevant local records centre. And I think one of the one of the things that you think about is although the initial funding for the project was very much sort of Northumberland based now that that's over certainly would like to sort of do more of the projects sort of north of the border as well because a lot they've not got breeding Ida there and maybe they've not got the same link to St Cuthbert that Northumberland has again you, they do have Ida ducks in in, in Berwickshire as well so it's worth making that and certainly in terms of Ida duck day as well I think that's not we don't see that as a as a sort of just a, a local thing as well. So if anyone from outside of Northumberland wants to join with that, I think all the better, all the merrier. And indeed we did have interest from sort of Isle of May joining in as well around Ida Duck Day last year. So again, um, it's something D on my list of things to do is actually to email Karen and, and Neil uh, south of the border, just to make them aware that we're holding that. And if there's anything, you want to link into through seascapes the heritage coast you're more than welcome to do so in terms of uh whatever we plan for either of day yeah yeah so yeah obviously um uh yeah the records yeah would uh um come through through to us so our eric area reaches right to uh the sort of north yorkshire border so yeah if you're if you're down that way do submit your records yeah um Someone is asking, I think it might still be D, <laughs> how many app downloads or users are there? Sorry for all the questions. I'm really interested in the use of an app. So, so um, yeah, how, how many people have, have you got a rough idea? Ooh, been, um, I'm not sure. I must have, I don't think I've ever counted up the unique users of it. Um, I can, I can, it's easy enough just to, to, to pull the data off and have a look, Dean. I can maybe email you with the answer. Um, it's 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 not it's not 379 individual users. So there are some people doing sort of repeat uh, yeah. uh, observations, but I'm afraid I don't know off the top of my head how many unique users we've got. But it's simple enough to to get that information, let you know a number around that. Great, 
Great. I think that at the moment that's all the questions in the, the chat. I don't know if uh, anybody, is that right? Is anybody else got um, want to pop a question in or turn on their video and, and, and ask one direct to Nick? Um, while people are thinking about that, just wondering, the, the wintering eiders in our area, where is either where do they come from or where do they disperse to, do you know? Um, I mean, they, 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 are, they are sort of, I think they are largely sort of local resident population of that as well. Um, I'm not aware that they're, they're, they're necessarily being supplemented by lots of incomers from outside the area. Um, so again, they are there, and again, they, they're, they're, found, they're, they're fairly well distributed along, along the coast there in terms of, but uh, there are some particularly good areas where, you know, you can only reliably see uh, Idas during the winter. So again, places like Amble Harbour, Seahouses Harbour, Beadnell is a good place as well. Um, less extent, probably around uh, uh, St Mary's Lighthouse and Blythe as well, maybe. Uh, good places to see them. All right, all right. So they're fairly a kind of quite a local resident population then. So, uh, um, so, oh, yes. so let's see, Mike's got a question there. Um, I think he's raised his hand. So Mike, I don't know if you want to pop your video on and um, or or not, or just ask in the I can't scene. Put my video you. on, you won't let me. Uh, oh, all right, all right. <laughs> Would you like it on? I don't mind. Right. I, I, I just wondered if it was worth your while trying to access historic records from um, things like the bird track database. Mm. Uh, yes, and de definitely in terms of, uh, certainly I know, I think in terms of the work that the, the, the Natural England's doing, they are, I think they are drawing on data sources from a number of that so I mean it, it's it's a question we, we, we had um, about the app because I know um, one thing we did with Eric um, back in October was we had a what we called a sort of a, a curry duck challenge where we were trying to promote use of the app and we we set a challenge to get a certain number of additional records in the app within a, a month-long period and we did have some queries then from people saying, but what about uh, other apps I'm using or other recording schemes I'm doing? And I think the answer to that is, no, that, that, that's, that's great, that's, that's fine. Um, the, all of that information feeds into the sort of national data sets and can be accessed by ourselves and by conservation bodies, etc. to actually build up that picture about IDAs as well. So again, uh, although we're sort of promoting our, our app um, partly because of that ability to record disturbance issues on that. Recording things through like, like bird tracker it, it is fine. That information feeds into the system and is available for conservation organisations to, um, um, to inform their activity. And as I say, Natural England at the minute, I think is, uh, I don't want to put Steve Percival on, on the spot who I think is, is working as a contractor for them at the minute to do some of that data collection, but I believe is bringing in a lot of those other existing data sets from Bird Tracker and, and other places as well to, to build up that picture about how it is. Great, great, thanks. Um, so I think that's, I don't see anyone else's hand up and there's no more questions in the chat. So. Um, I'll just say thanks, uh, Nick. That that was really great to have, like I say, just that um, reconnection almost with the, the the coastline and how um, how lucky we are to have have that basically on our doorstep and uh, um, and and hear about those protections. And I hope uh, I hope some of you will be encouraged to get your either sightings in there and have a go with the app. And Nick's got some really great uh, little help videos on the on your YouTube channel. So it's really, really great step by step. So um, thanks for uh, speaking tonight, um, Nick, that, that was a 
that, that was really interesting and, and nice to get all that sort of update. Um, so th thanks for thanks for joining in. And yeah, the the technical hitches weren't too much of a technical hitch. It didn't didn't detract from the talk really. So no, that's okay. No, no, thank you for asking us and thank you for all your time. And again, um, say and any any records, uh, basically if anything, marine or coastal are much appreciated and are very helpful to people working in the field. Great, thanks. So thanks everyone for joining and um, our next talk is next uh, Wednesday, I think on the 14th, Tuesday, Tuesday, the 14th. Um, um, it's, um, we've got Ian Wallace talking about caddis flies, which might sound a bit niche, but as, as we all probably know, all nature's connected and um, it's always great to hear from an expert. And I think Ian will have some interesting little uh, insights into the world of the caddis fly so hope you can join us on that one uh, next week and thanks everybody for um joining in tonight and hope you've enjoyed it and we can stop recording now <laughs> <laughs>